Well, what can I say? I can say thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations to Cairo Security Camp for 10 years. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. And you're absolutely right. It is all about the community. It is about security people working together because we are facing a very strong enemy. When you think about the work that we security people do, it's the kind of work where what you're really trying to do is you're trying to help other people. Our clients and customers and our friends come to us asking for help, asking us to help them in problems that they could ever, never solve by themselves. Can you help me? My systems have been taken over by a criminal. How can you help our company? Our operations have stopped because we've been hacked. Can you help our organization? We've had a data leak. We've lost our important information. Can you help me? I've lost my photos. I've lost the history of my children growing up. And that's what we do. We help them because we have the skills. And of course, for almost all of us here, it's a job. Yeah, we get paid to do what we do, but it's a little bit more than just a job. When I was a small boy growing up in Helsinki, Finland, whenever my mother would ask me that, Mikko, what are you going to do when you grow up? I would tell her that I'm going to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor. Mikko, why do you want to become a doctor? Because I want to help people. That's what I said. Now, when I grew older, I realized that um, I actually can't really look at blood. When I see blood, I don't feel too good. And if you can't look at blood, you won't become a doctor. So I didn't become a doctor. But I guess I became a kind of a, I don't know, a virus doctor. I've spent almost 30 years analyzing malware, reverse engineering viruses, hunting down the people behind the attacks, trying to understand where the people who do these attacks are coming from. And I'm really happy to be here today in Cairo. It's been several years since I've been in Egypt before. And you have a very rich country here in Egypt. A very rich country. Rich in people, rich in talent, rich in skills. The most important resource a country can have is its people. Now, whenever I talk with professionals from this region, what I see is great skills, smart people. As long as we take good care of our people and as long as we educate the next generation growing up, we have no problems in the world. This country with 100 million people is rich with the skills you need to take the whole country, the whole region to the next step, to future, to our future. Now, when I think about Egyptian hackers, many of you will remember in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we would regularly see web defacements. Remember these? Someone would hack a website, then they would delete the front page of the website and replace it with stupid messages and images and greetings to their gang members and what have you. We were tracking down web defacement gangs pretty closely in the late 1990s. And the most active gangs were always from Egypt. I could never figure out why. But there were tons and tons of young, eager hackers from Egypt hacking websites in the United States and in Japan and in Canada, everywhere around the world. It was Egyptians and Turkish hackers 
doing a very large part of the early web defacements. But it's also a good example on how the world has changed. Those hackers hacking websites had no motive. I mean, they just wanted to put their name on a hacked website or their handle, nickname there. Just like when you do graffiti and spray something on the wall with no permission, it's just to get some recognition. You don't, you don't get any money for doing web defacements, just like you don't get any money for doing graffiti on somebody's wall with no permission. And that's a good example on how our world has changed. Today, if someone hacks a website, they're not going to do a web defacement. No. They're going to steal the database of user credentials and passwords or hashed passwords, and then they will crack the passwords and use them in scams or sell them further for money or steal the credit card numbers. Or they will replace the front page with a new page which looks exactly like the original page, but now it has an exploit kit embedded on the front page to make money. Money changed everything. Money changed everything. And today, the hackers we see are not just graffiti artists, they are organized criminals. Now, you might be wondering why I have images of moon going on behind me. Well, it's because it's been 50 years since we went to the moon. Two months ago, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Man on the Moon. And next month, in October, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of this. This is a logbook from October 1969. And in that logbook called Implog, there's one entry dated the 29th of October 1969, at 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m. in the evening, the first packet on the Internet. The first packet on the Internet. The first time a packet of data goes from one computer to another computer on the Internet. 50 years ago. 50 years is a long time. I'm 50 years old myself. This is how much 50 years is. But then again, it's not that long. And this technological revolution that has happened since this first packet just blows the mind. I believe that we are all very, very lucky to be alive right now, to be alive during this massive technological change, during this time when the mankind is going through multiple technological revolutions multiple technological revolutions. This started the Internet Revolution. And the Internet Revolution already happened. It's already behind us. Many of you still remember the time, well, some of you remember the time when we were using computers, but those computers were not online. You know, early 1990s, you would have your PC or your Mac, and if you would create some files, you couldn't email the files, or you couldn't put them on Dropbox, or you couldn't send them over any chat, you were using the USB thumb drive of the 1990s. This is how we were moving files around. This is the USB thumb drive of 1991. And today, you won't be able to find a single computer which isn't online. All computers went online during our lifetime. So in that sense, the Internet revolution already happened. And what's happening right now is the next revolution, which is the revolution of everything else going online. Computers already went online. Now everything else will go online. Now everything else will become a computer and they will go online as well. If it uses electricity, it will be online. 
if it uses electricity, it will be online. Everything becomes smart. And yes, I am the father of the Hyppönen law, which says that if it's smart, it's vulnerable. As we add more functionality into our devices, they inherently become more insecure. You think about simple things like a smart watch. This watch is on the internet. It can be hacked. It might not be easy, but it can be done. But then when you think about a traditional watch, like a wrist watch that you have to wind, how do you hack that? Well, you don't. And this is the difference. When you add more functionality, things become inherently more insecure. It's just the way it is. Now, this revolution is only in the very beginning. Today, when we see things connecting to the internet that are not computers, we're thinking about things like smart televisions or, I don't know, smart cars. But even the stupid things will go online. I'm not worried about the smart things as much as I am worried about the stupid things. And the stupid things will go online for a different reason. We've all heard that data is the new oil. And this is true in many ways. Data is becoming more and more valuable. And that's the main reason why everything will become a computer. Vendors who build devices that today are not on the internet want to put them on the internet so they can collect data, valuable data, like where are our devices being used? What kind of users you are devices? When do they use them? Where are these people? Where do they live? Things like that. And this will lead to a world where all devices will be on the internet and they will be online with new kinds of technologies. Right now there's plenty of talk about 5G and there will be further technologies, 6G, 7G, new mechanisms like Zigbee and Sigfox, which will take our devices online with no need for accounts or SIMs. And this will lead us to a future where internet will disappear. Mark my words, internet will disappear. In 20 years, 30 years, nobody will speak about the internet. It will disappear. It will be so ubiquitous, so built in into our everyday lives that we don't even think about it. Sort of like breathing air. You assume that there is air everywhere and you don't really have to think about breathing in and out. Or, well, today like electricity. Of course you assume that there is electricity. If you travel to another country, I wonder if they have electricity there. Yes, they will. This is what will happen to internet. It will be everywhere. We all will be online all the time and all of our devices will be online all the time using some yet to be designed technology. There won't be any SIM cards or accounts or payments. Things will just be online everywhere, all over the globe. And when that happens, and it's going to happen, nobody never thinks about the internet. Nobody says that I'm going to go online. No, you will be online. All of our devices will be online all the time. And this is great. And it's horrible. Just like the internet itself. Internet is the best thing and the worst thing that has happened during our lifetime. Internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. Internet is great. I, I love the internet. I really do love the internet. The upsides are huge. When you think about all the business, all the connectivity, all the entertainment that we have received thanks to the internet, it's great. But, at the very same time, the internet has exposed us to new kinds of risks which we didn't have to worry about at all. Internet takes away geography. There is no geography on the internet. There are no distances, there are no borders. And that's great, 
And it's bad because then the criminals who can be anywhere on the planet can now reach you. And it changes the way we have to worry about our level of risk in becoming a victim or the risk that our company becomes a victim. So on the 19th of March this year, when employees of the second largest company in Norway went to their offices in the morning, what they saw at the door at the headquarters of the company was a sign. A sign which said in Norwegian that please do not turn on your computer. And then there's an added note at 7.40 in the morning that you can use your phones, but please do not use your computers. The company in question is called Norsk Hydro, the second largest company in Norway, one of the largest companies in the world manufacturing aluminum. They were hit with a targeted attack by an organized crime gang. And this company operates all over the world. They have aluminum factories everywhere on the planet. And today, all factories, whether they make aluminum or steel or, I don't know, food, they are all being run by things like this. PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. This one is made by Siemens. This is the S7400. The reason I picked this one for my pictures is that this is the one that Stuxnet was targeting in Iran in, in 2010. But it could as well be a PLC made by Schneider or by Honeywell or by any of the other large manufacturers. And while they don't look like traditional computers, they are computers. They are small 32-bit Linux servers. They control our world. They control every single plant, every single factory, every single power plant. The lights are on in this room right now thanks to devices like this. The lunch that you will have later today was at least partially made in a food processing plant being run by these. And when Norse Kudro, the aluminum manufacturer, was hit in March, they had to take all of their computing capability offline. All laptops offline, all desktops offline, all servers offline, all PLCs offline. And this is remarkably risky because manufacturing of aluminum is very, very fragile. When you build an aluminum factory, you build it, you start it, and then you never stop. You cannot stop an aluminum factory. If you have to stop the factory, you will typically lose the whole factory. And this is what we were worried about was going to happen in this case. Because how on earth would you be able to run a modern factory without computers. Surely you cannot do it. Except in this case, they, they could do it. They didn't lose a single factory, even though they had to go to manual mode. How was this possible? Well, the answer is it was possible, possible because this company still had a bunch of old geeks who were working for them. They still had guys who remembered how it used to be, who remembered how did you run a factory like this before computers, before PLCs. Guys who still had binders with lists of ingredients and temperatures and recipes you need to run a factory like this. Quite incredible. These guys just earned their pension. But the question is, how much longer can we do this? It's incredible this was even possible today. Can we still do this in five years, ten years? Probably not. We are at the very end of the time where we can operate things like these without the computers that today run our whole societies. 
And we, mankind, have a history of making innovations which reach out way to the future, which seem like a great idea right now, and then we realize later that it was a really bad idea. Let me play you a TV ad from the 1950s. Smart woman, she's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman, she's using Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Easiest flooring to install, easiest flooring to care for. Save every way with Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Asbestos was such a great idea. When asbestos, the material, was invented, it seemed like the perfect material. Cheap to make. Very good in insulation, can be molded to any mold you want, doesn't catch fire. Perfect. Let's put asbestos everywhere. Until 20 years later, we realized that actually it was a horrible idea and very poisonous. And we're still suffering from problems created by this innovation. And what we're doing today, in many ways, reminds me of IT asbestos. IT asbestos is what we are doing today when we turn everything into a computer running an old and outdated Linux kernel with no capabilities for patching them and with built-in credentials and passwords which cannot be changed by the users combined with open telnet ports and then connecting these to the public internet by the millions. This is what we're doing today. Most of the new cheap IoT devices that are being manufactured in China and used all over the world are like this. Hopelessly insecure cheap devices which cannot be secured even by the end user and they are connected to public internet. Many of the mistakes that we had already figured out and fixed on our computers are now returning on IoT systems. Things like Telnet, like we got rid of Telnet as a protocol on our servers in the 1990s because Telnet was such a bad idea, an unencrypted protocol which you use for authentication. So we replaced Telnet with SSH. Well, today you will find more Telnet traffic than in the last 20 years, thanks to IoT devices. And this is being used by IoT attacks, which we now see everywhere. Let me show you statistics from two days ago. Stats from bad packets looking at IoT botnets. Botnets which don't infect computers at all, which only infect security cameras and doorbells and smart fridges. And when we look at statistics, number four, worldwide, Egypt, right here. There's a very large amount of IoT devices in Egypt, and very big part of those are hopelessly insecure. This is the IT asbestos legacy that we are now creating and we are leaving to our children. This is our asbestos. The situation with IoT malware has become so bad that it has actually turned our statistics upside down. When we look at statistics at our honeypots, we run a global network of honeypots which collects tons and tons of attack traffic. The traffic we used to see on our honeypots used to be Windows malware. You know, WannaCry and Petya and uh, uh, all legacy Windows malware which would go around the world for years and years. Well, when we look at current statistics, it's mostly Linux malware. Our honeypots are now seeing more Linux malware than Windows malware. And that's quite remarkable. And yes, of course, you can argue that you, this is not real Linux. This is, this is not like desktop Linux or servers. This is IoT. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's also a great example on how versatile Linux is. Most of the phones in this room run Linux. Most of the cloud runs Linux. And most of IoT devices run Linux. It's the same kernel everywhere. 
But this is a huge shift. Shift from Windows malware being number one to Linux IoT malware being number one worldwide in our honeypots. So the attacks, which used to be the norm, like Windows ransomware, it is still there. But we are seeing a clear change happening right now. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry about ransomware. We should. This problem isn't going away anytime soon. When we look at our roadmap of malware families which make money with ransomware techniques, the roadmap has become so large, I can't even fit it on a single slide anymore. And the amount of money in Bitcoin being made by ransomware gangs is just remarkably large. I wonder how much money they are making. Well, we don't have to wonder, because one of the main gangs, the Gantcrab gang, retired this year. They posted a message to the admin interface of this ransomware as a service system that they were running. This is the interface for Gantcrab. This is what the criminals who run this ransomware family see. And then there's a note for updates where the creators of this ransomware can post notes. And they posted a note earlier this year saying that, you know, we've earned $150 million. We're good. We're retiring now. We will stop. We won't be making any more updates. We won't be making any more ransomware. We've laundered our money. We're going to spend the rest of our lives in Bahamas. That's it. Goodbye. We are leaving for a well-deserved retirement. We have proven that by doing evil deeds, retribution doesn't come. I think they are too early claiming that. I hope we can prove them wrong. But it's not just all about money making. We have a completely different kind of an attack targeting our systems when we think about governmental attacks. The very first governmental attack that I was working with was in 2003, so 16 years ago. And that was the Chinese. That was the PLA targeting defense contractors with uh, booby-trapped, exploit-ridden Word and Excel documents. And we still see attacks like that today. Governmental attacks can be split into two different groups. Either it's about espionage or it's about sabotage. Espionage, stealing information, spying, or sabotage, using cyber attacks to disable things. Stuxnet is a good example. And when you are being targeted by a governmental attacker, things are different. It's quite different and it's quite hard to fight these problems. Because criminals, when criminal networks or organized crime gangs try to hack you, they're not really interested in you. They're not interested in you. They're not interested in your company. No, they're interested in money. They're not interested in you, they're interested in money. And if it's too hard, too slow, too expensive to hack your network, they will forget about you. And they will go after an easier target. They will go after the low-hanging fruit. And believe me when I tell you that the internet is a garden of low-hanging fruits. It's so easy to find an easier target. So to secure your organization against criminal attackers, you don't have to be too secure. It's enough to be a little bit more secure than the other targets. And the attackers will go after the easier targets if they are after money. And most attackers are after money. But if you work for an organization which does have to worry about governments, like foreign intelligence agencies or foreign militaries, then things are different. Because those attackers are not interested in money. Those attackers typically work 
inside a military organization. And what military organizations do is that they follow orders. And these attackers have been given an order. You go and hack that organization, you steal this information, report back to me when you've done it. Go. That's the order. And if that's what you're doing, that's what you're going to do. If you can't get in, you're not going to change your mind that this is too hard, I can't break into here, I'll go and hack someone else. You're not going to do that. You're going to keep trying. You're going to be persistent. If you can't find a way in, you will bring in more people, more resources. You try different things. You keep trying over and over and over again until you get in. And if you are fighting an attacker like that, well, that's a very hard attacker to fight. A persistent attacker is very hard to fight. If they can't find any other way in, eventually they will just get one of their guys to be recruited to work inside the organization that they have to breach. It's hard. It's hard if your attacker doesn't give up, if the attacker is really persistent. It's sort of a similar scenario when you hire a company to do a penetration test or a red teaming test against your network. It's, it's the same scenario, like they will try to get into your network and if they can't get in, they're not going to change their mind. We can't hack this company, let's hack someone else. Of course not, because that would be criminal. They will keep trying to break into you and only you and if they can't get in, they will bring more resources, try different things until they run out of time. They don't have unlimited time like governmental attackers often do. But in that way, they are similar. So when you hire a pen test or when you do a pen test yourself, in many ways it's more similar to governmental attackers than criminal attackers. There's always exceptions though, but this is the big picture. And when we look at governmental attacks, there's two countries which keep popping up over and over again as attackers. Russia and China. Now this doesn't mean that Russia and China would be the only governments doing attacks like these. Of course not. Because today every technically capable country is building both offense and defense in the cyber world. This includes Egypt. Egypt is building both offense and defense in the cyber world, as you should. Today, to have credible defensive capabilities includes the, the capabilities to, do at to attack if needed to do that. But the reason why China and Russia make the headlines over and over again is that these countries don't really seem to care too much if they get caught. United States, for example, is investing much more money into offensive cyber attacks. And they've done it for longer than anyone else. But they've been caught very few times. Because they care about getting caught much, much more than what Russians and China, Chinese do. But it's quite remarkable when you compare these two countries. They're both massively large countries. Russia is the biggest country on the planet. China has more people than any other country on the planet. They're both countries filled with great technological developers, great coders, great researchers, great reverse engineers, great mathematicians, great physicists. So it's quite remarkable and quite weird when you think about that, that these countries are very different when it comes to creating and exporting technology. China creates and exports technology all the time. We can all name Chinese tech companies like that. You know, Lenovo, ZTE, Xiaomi, OnePlus, uh, Huawei, all these. Try naming, for example, Russian mobile phone makers. Can you name any? I don't think so. We all have Chinese chips in our pockets right now. Every single one of you has Chinese chips in your pocket. None of you 
have anything made in Russia in your pockets right now. None of you have anything made in Russia in your pockets, unless one of you carries a Kalashnikov. And if you're carrying a Kalashnikov, don't tell me. And isn't that a little bit weird? And of course, this means that potentially China has a much, much better visibility on the rest of the world compared to Russia, especially during times of crisis where they might be inclined to use this upper hand of technological reach that they have. And then there is the outlier, which is North Korea. I told you that all governmental attacks are either about sabotage or about espionage. The exception is North Korea, because North Korea is the only country on the planet which is willing to do s governmental cyber attacks to steal money. Governmental cyber attacks to steal money. North Korea is willing to steal from other governments with hacks and ransomware trojans in order to fix their budget deficit. And that is quite remarkable. We know a little bit about the operations run by the North Korean hacking teams, including operations of Mr. Park Hyuk, one of the members of the so-called Lazarus gang, which was involved, also known as Lab 110, which was involved in the Sony Pictures hack because of the interview movie, as well as the Swift hack, as well as WannaCry ransomware attack. They've used multiple different fronts to try to hide their operations. But the money from these hacks goes back to North Korea, goes back to their weapons program. This is quite remarkable. If someone would have told you 20 years ago that eventually there will be cases where countries hack other countries with computer attacks to steal money, and then fix their own budgets with those mo monies, that would have sounded pretty far-fetched. But that's exactly where we are today. And it gives you an idea about how far-fetched things that will happen in our future will sound today. They will sound like science fiction. We wrote about the operations done by North Korea in our paper called Cyber Threat Landscape for the Finance Sector, which we pu published in July. You can actually download this from our website if you're interested in the details in this. But the fact is that we are in a new arms race. And we will be in this arms race for decades to come. Part of our future together will be that we will be in a cyber arms race, just like we were in a nuclear arms race for the last 60 years. We spent the last 60 years in nuclear arms race, we will spend the next 60 years, maybe, in cyber arms race. Because cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. Affordable, effective, and deniable. That's a pretty good combination in any weapon. However, just like real-world weapons, cyber weapons also rust. They don't work forever. When you look at the kinds of attacks that governments have done, they typically target vulnerabilities with exploits. And vulnerabilities don't stay vulnerable forever. The bugs get found and fixed. Systems get changed. Operating systems are migrated to other operating systems. If you find a completely unknown vulnerability today from some common system, it won't be there in 10 years' time, maybe in five. So you have a limited time window when to use these kind of devices, these kinds of weapons. And that creates a totally different landscape for these weapons, because the power of traditional weapons is typically not in using them, it's in deterrence. It's in having the weapons, showing the weapons to your enemy, and then hoping that they won't attack because they know you have them. This works especially well with nuclear weapons. This is why countries which have nuclear weapons do nuclear weapons testing. They want to show to other countries that, hey, look at this, we have nuclear weapons. Don't come around here, we have nuclear weapons. 
This is the reason why we know how many tanks the Russians have or how many aircraft carriers the United States has or how many fighter jets the Egypt Air Force has. How would you find out how many fighter jets does the Egypt Air Force have? Well, of course you would Google for it and you would find it from Wikipedia. This is public information. This is why militaries do military parades to show what they have to get deterrence power. But how do you do a military parade for cyber weapons? And maybe one part of our future will be that there will be something like that. Maybe there will be public demonstrations of cyber power shown in order to get some deterrence power out of cyber weapons, maybe. Technology has always shaped the phase of conflicts, shaped where we fight our wars. Hundreds of years ago, when we had no other technology than swords, all of our wars were fought on land until we got good enough technology to build warships. And then war expanded from land to sea and then from sea to air, and then we got satellites and stuff, so space war, and now cyberspace war. Uh, when you look at modern conflicts like Russia-Ukraine, which is happening right now, that war is right now being fought on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace. So cyber is just a domain for conflict. But it's not going to end here. We have now five domains, and there will be more domains. There will be a sixth domain for war, seventh domain for war. Uh, whatever those will be, we can't imagine them today. And if we try to imagine them today, they will sound like science fiction. The sixth domain could be, I don't know, artificial intelligence war or DNA warfare, or nano warfare. What would nano warfare look like? I don't know, but maybe an enemy could fly over your country drop, dropping nanobots, which would be so small they would go airborne and then enter the bloodstream of your soldiers and go to their brain and change their thoughts. Does that sound like science fiction? Yes, it does. Just like cyber war, sounded like science fiction 30 years ago. And artificial intelligence or machine learning is clearly shaping our world right now. Machine learning is being extensively used today, not just by search engines or cloud systems, but security companies, for example. And adversarial networks, which can learn by just trying things against other competing algorithms, are able to generate results that are hard for us to understand. Like generate unlimited amounts of real-looking things that look real or, or fairly real to us humans, but are completely artificial. So AI will matter. But you don't have to believe me. You don't have to take that from me. You can take that from Mr. Putin. Тот, не стать лидером в этой сфере, станет лидером мира. Who will become the leader in artificial intelligence will become the leader of the world. And I believe that developments in creating strong, wide, superhuman intelligence will increase the likelihood of conflict, not decrease. They will increase the likelihood of conflict. Just for a second, imagine that a country or a company would announce that we are on the verge of having superhuman intelligence. We believe we have it, 
next month. Imagine how other countries would react. When they would hear something like that, they would understand that, oh my God, if they get that functionality, it's going to be game over. They have superhuman intelligence. They will win everything. They will win every competition. They will have superior technology and planning. They will win every war. We must steal that technology before they get it. Or if we cannot steal it, then we must destroy it. And it could be that the next big conflict will start from something like this. But that is still way, way in the future, because we are nowhere near close to levels of human intelligence. Today's technology, yes, works on machine learning, and machines are good at learning. But I don't believe we have capability of simulating human intelligence in the next couple of decades. I do believe it's going to happen, but not very soon. So for now, our work will remain to be like it has been for the last decades. We play the ever-ending game of security Tetris. Because securing computers reminds me of Tetris. It reminds me of Tetris because just like in Tetris, whenever you succeed in something, your success will disappear. And whenever you fail, your failures will pile up. Happens in security, just like in Tetris. And we've been spending so much effort into building walls around our networks, hoping that if we just build strong enough walls, all enemies will stay outside. Well, if you only put all of your effort into building walls, that means you're not looking what's happening inside of your network. And this is where we are failing the hardest today. Companies get breached and they have no idea. It will take them literally weeks, months, even years before they realize that they've been breached. And if you don't detect that you've been breached, you cannot react to your breach. And when security works, when you do your job right, It's invisible. I see this a lot when I go and meet our clients and customers. I might go to a meeting with the leadership team. We discuss about what they've been doing. And uh, typically, it's the CFO which looks at the budget and then asks me that, hey, it says here that we spent 50,000 euros last year or $50,000 last year into buying software and services from you guys. Why are we spending 50,000 on security problems? We have no security problems. And I typically answer him by saying that, you know what? This meeting room where we are, it's very nice and very clean. It's awfully clean in here. I'll tell you what, you can fire all of your cleaners and janitors Clearly, you don't need them anymore because it's so clean in here. So when you do your job right, it's invisible. There will not be a headline in newspapers tomorrow morning which says that you know, the second largest company in Egypt was not hacked yesterday. That's not news. If a company does not get hacked, it's not news at all. But when a company does get hacked, it's going to be on the front page. And the fact is that rarely is anyone thanked for the work they did to prevent the disaster that did not happen. So I want to thank you for doing your work in preventing the disasters that will not happen. Now and in our future as well. We have time for questions, and we have a microphone going around the audience. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions as long as you want.
And we have a question there in the back. Let's get a microphone to the gentleman in the back. Um, uh, thank you so much for the uh, uh, incredible presentation. It's, uh, it's a very insightful, as always. Um, so you have mentioned a few key words about revolution and governmental attack. And as you can see, we live in, in a region where revolution is coming all over the last few years. And mm -hmm. it's driven by political instability. And we have a very unique threat in this region about the governmental attack, which is actually using a lot of, you know, cyber arm and commercial spyware to sure. target the people and so on, which is, may not be presented in your presentation, but is actually one of the threats that faces the community in the Middle East, and maybe some of the people here. So my question is, what is your view about the using of the cyber arm against people, not only in the Middle East, but everywhere? And are you satisfied of the vendors and, uh, and antivirus companies' effort hmm. to defend the people that may not be your clients, but the people of the world? Are you satisfied about the effort? And what's your view about it? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, it's a great question. And of course, you're absolutely right. This region has had its challenges and problems with over-aggressive governmental work trying to spy on their own people. We, for example, I was working closely with the Finn Fisher incident around eight years ago, which then involved um, the Egyptian government as well. And I totally understand why governmental agencies want to use the internet like this. It makes perfect sense. Intelligence gathering is about collecting information. Information used to be physical. It used to be something on paper. It used to be people discussing things face to face. Today, information is data. Information is no longer on paper. You don't have to go anywhere to get to the information. And people don't speak. Well, they still speak face to face, but they even more speak on their devices. And when we think about technology and police work, when phone, landline phones became commonplace, eventually we, our societies, we gave the permission to police so that they could listen into the phone calls to catch criminals. We decided that the trade-off that the cops could listen to some innocent person's phone call is bigger than criminals being able to communicate so that they, nobody would ever realize what they're saying. So we gave the cops the right for wiretaps. Then mobile phones became a thing. We granted the cops the right to listen to mobile phones. Then we granted them the right to tap text messages. Eventually, we granted them the right to, to intercept emails over internet connectivity. But as encryption has become commonplace, none of that really matters anymore. No matter how well cops or intelligence agencies or governmental agencies can tap, the connection, the cables, it doesn't matter if it's end-to-end -end encrypted. This is why we are now seeing such a boom in governmental malware, so you can infect the endpoints. Then it doesn't matter if the transmission is encrypted because the, they are at the endpoints. So what do I think about this? I think transparency is the key. We have to be able to fight bad people. We have to be able to fight criminals, organized crime, extremists and terrorists and foreign spies. For that, our governmental agencies need access to the internet. However, we, the citizens, we need information about what they do. We need information about how much they are spying on us citizens and how they are getting results. Now, agencies like this in general don't want to disclose anything. And I perfectly understand why they don't want to disclose information about ongoing uh, projects or ongoing investigations. But they could, for example, put out statistics, annual statistics. Last year, we infected 900 Egyptian citizens' home computer 
to see what they were doing. And out of those 900, let's say 850, turned out to be criminals or extremists or terrorists. And then 50 turned out to be innocent. Too bad. If it's like that, I think people would be, okay, fair enough. That's a good trade-off. However, if the outcome would be that last year we infected 900 citizens' computers and two of them turn out to be criminals, rest of them turn out to be innocent people, then I think people would vote differently or choose differently. So what we need as citizens, what we need is transparency about what our governments are doing and how effective it is. Thank you. We had another question there in the back, and then we have one over here. I guess we'll take one over here. Thank you. Okay, my question is regarding your opinion for cyber weapons when they are sold. But the problem is, as you said, governments need to protect themselves and their assets and their people. So there's two sides here. And I have experience with the two sides. When you work with law enforcement, you need to have access. And to be honest, having access and big data right now to collect all of this data helps you a lot in fighting. And in the same time, on the other side, you have all the, the freedom for the people and the transparency, as you said. So my question here, how you define the thin line between we need to do X and Y and Z to protect and have the law enforcement being able to do this, and in the same time, protect the people? Because as you said, I need to protect the endpoints. I need to protect the intransit, and same time, I need to have visibility. Just to have a small example, when we talk about the financial sector, as you said, I had the experience that once we have blockchains and we have Bitcoins and Ethereum and everything else, we lost visibility. And it was immediately get used to evade money laundering activities. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. So what's your opinion on yep. this? Yeah. Yes, you're right. Just like blockchain technology is a trade-off, we get benefits and we get problems. Same thing with governmental activity. It's a trade-off between privacy and security. And to answer your question, have we found the thin line? No, because this is all brand new. We're still looking for the right trade-off. We're looking for the right line where to be. This is all happening very quickly. We are the first citizens in millions of years of mankind's history. We are the first ones whose lives can be tracked from start to finish. This has never been possible before. Today, the powers that be can track our lives from birth to death. Like where we are, where do we travel, where are we with, who are we with, who do we communicate with. We carry these tracking devices on ourselves everywhere we go. We even sleep right next to them. And this information, for the first time, can be collected and can be saved forever. What does it really mean? Well, we don't really know. I don't think we really understand this yet because it's all brand new. And yes, we are still looking for the right trade-off and, and the right fine line. More questions? We have a question here in the front. Just the microphone is right there behind you. Uh, first of all, thanks for your amazing talk. Um, I really enjoyed it, and um, it was really eye-opening. Um, the question is, how would one get into cybersecurity research? Uh, especially that I'm still a student, and a lot of people here are. So how would a student uh, like prepare himself to work for uh, like in cybersecurity research mm -hmm. by the time of his graduation? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I actually get questions about similar topics a lot. Um, I do quite a lot of teaching in different universities. I do lectures in universities around the world and I get a lot of, for example, students asking, okay, uh, you got me interested in security, I want to start studying, I want to learn more, how do I do this? And the answer is complex and it's a bit long. So I've written a, a short write-up on this. So what I ask you to do, you and the rest of you, Drop me a DM on Twitter. My DMs are open. You can send me a private message on Twitter. And I'll send you back the thing I've written about how to get started, how to get um, 
how to find your own area, how to pick your own niche, how to find mentors, what to read, what are good books, what are good resources, things like that. You can drop me a note on DM or you can email me. My, you can find my email address by Googling and I will get back to you on that. Thank you for the question. Do we have more questions? We have there in the back. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have another question. So basically one of the examples you mentioned about the countries that have a cyber capability, like a really complex cyber capability is China and Russia. And all over the news, we see North Korea, Iran, and so on. But when the expert look to the cyber capability and do the analysis, they may discover that this capability are not very complex as it should be. We look into the samples from Iranian APT and define it's a very simple web shell and malware and so on. In the same time, the news all around the world is coming about the cyber capability from Iran, cyber capability from North Korea, which is feeling as an exaggeration about those capability. We've seen um, a big moment that the security community and the security industry is driven by the fear of certain countries, while in the same time, some other countries such as USA or maybe Israel, they may have more powerful and complex that we don't know anything about it. Do you think this is a good state for the security industry to be driven by the fear of and complex news driven uh, uh, outlets, mm. or you think our threat model about the security enemy may be completely wrong right now? Thank you. One clear development which I've seen, which is coming out from what you described, is that um, we see more and more companies asking questions about where their security technology is coming from. Um, and I, I guess I might be seeing it more than some other companies do because we are seen as fairly impartial. F-Secure is headquartered in Helsinki, Finland. Finland is not a superpower. Very few countries are worried about Finnish intelligence agencies or you know, our international power. And we are seen as very impartial. We're not even part of NATO. Um, and these are the kind of questions that I see when companies for one reason or another, don't want to buy, let's say, Chinese security technology or US-made security technology. But it's also a question about what is the responsibility of security companies during times of conflict and during times of crisis. Finland has a big border with a big neighbor. We have 1,600 kilometers of border with the Russians. Both my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. So that's one of the reasons why we've, as a security company, have been giving a very close eye on the Russian offensive technology being used by Russian government. But I recently went back to read the um, Geneva Convention, which defines the rules of law for war, including defining what is a legitimate target, legitimate military target during times of conflict and during times of war. And the way I read the Geneva Convention, to me it looks like it would define companies like F-Secure to be a valid military target during times of conflict or times of war. So if we would end up in a war, a foreign state could, for example, bomb our headquarters and that would be a legitimate target. And that really gives me a pause. That is really something I never thought about when I joined this company almost 30 years ago. When I joined this company, I joined this small gang of geeks and nerds who were playing this funny game of analyzing viruses on floppy disks and trying to decrypt them before they spread too far, which was sort of like funny games. I definitely did not sign up for a work where we would be fighting organized crime gangs and extremists and foreign intelligence agencies and foreign militaries and where our headquarters would be a valid target for bombing. I definitely didn't sign up for this shit, but this is where I ended up. And this is the world where we live today. 
And we'll take one last question before we go for break. I guess we don't have time, Miko. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Miko. Thank you very much.